Hey, a pleasant good day, everyone. Welcome into the Sports Fanatic News Hockey Show. We are joined by a very special guest this evening that on the radio joins us. How are you doing tonight, Pete? Uh, I am doing really good. Uh, I've been doing a lot of hard work in school, but, uh, you know, hanging in there, almost done, almost to the winter term. And uh, how are you doing? Doing well, doing well. Always excited to talk some hockey and some hockey off-season yeah. reports. So uh, we're hopefully coming closer uh, in the beginning of January, hopefully to our season starting. Um, and we wish all the teams, of course, well that contracted COVID a quick, speedy recovery. And we hope they'll be able to get around that and figure out a safe way to start the season sometime in early January. But um We'll get right into it where uh, we had three different things happen since I did an off-season report with John from Off the Wall Hockey, which was the Bruins re-signed Jake DeBrus for two years, 7.35, which is another good contract for a developing uh, player. Johnny Boychuk retired, which is very helpful for the Islanders, which we'll get to. And then the Lightning re-signed Mikhail Sergachev to a three-year, $14.4 million contract. Of course, with Boychuk, that's helpful for the Islanders, but it's also unfortunate he had to retire early for an eye injury. Um, but what is the most interesting thing out of those three moves uh, for you? You know what? It's, I, the Mikhail Sergachev move was pretty surprising to me, um, as the Tampa Bay Lightning right now are they're stuck in a pretty good amount of cap hell right now. Um, especially wanting to go after another cup. And we've seen this before from a lot of teams where teams have to deal with a lot of um, cap hell after they deal with uh, winning a cup. And it, it, it's it's surprising. I thought there was going to be a team out there that would have offered cheated Mikhail Shrigachev. There was a lot of rumors about it with Boston and some other teams. But Mikhail Shrigachev got locked up on a great deal for $4.8 million for the next three years. And especially Boston getting Jake DeBrus on a nice deal. Jake DeBrus has been a good 20 goal scorer for the Boston Bruins, even almost a 30 goal scorer for their team. So having him back on the team will definitely be a key acquisition um, for the Boston Bruins and to keep them moving along throughout the offseason, um, as they're probably going to be looking to maybe go after uh, one of the open UFAs. Um, since they got Jake DeBrus, because we've been really waiting on the RFAs. This has been kind of the waiting period for the RFAs. We saw Barzell. We still have Shrum. There's still a lot of big RFA, RFA names out there. We had two come off the board today, so maybe we'll start seeing some more come off the board slowly. But I think uh, that will continue to go. And Johnny Boychuk, it's really unfortunate what happened to the guy with his eye injury. Um, I wish him the best of luck with his future. Um, it, it is a nice... Uh, Big cap relief for the New York Islanders, but it, it, it is still a big loss in Johnny Boychuk. Johnny Boychuk was a, a huge leader for the New York Islanders, so he'll definitely be missed in the locker room. Yeah, I agree. I think that's a guy that will be missed in the locker room. It, of course, frees up around $6 million bucks mm -hmm. in a cap space where they only had about three and some change. I think it was like three nine something. So now you have around $10 million in cap space which Barzal does not have an agent that likes to take discounts. So $3 million, almost 4 was nowhere close to enough to mm -hmm. extend Matthew Barzal, where now you actually have that gr probably some grace period even after extending him. So uh, that's definitely helpful for them in a million different ways. And, yeah, there has been a lot of um, these economic-type contracts in a sense because – the contract, the last move we had before DeBrus signed was weeks, a couple weeks ago, which mm -hmm. was when Rupe Hintz signed for the three years, 9.45, and he's been steadily progressing in Dallas. So you could say that's another pretty um, good deal, pretty good team-friendly deal if he keeps progressing at the rate he was by the time uh, that contract's uh, over in his final year. So. I think this year teams have been pretty smart and been able to get the guys for the value of they've been wanting to get them at, where Sergachev is just more of a surprise. That's like how Braden Point took a very cheap contract and everyone's going, huh? Uh, so mm -hmm. that's that's more Tampa being Tampa, it seems, where part of their winning ways and their team ways is kind of finding a way to make guys take less money where never in a million years would you think certain guys would get paid the way they are 
But yeah. because of the culture of Tampa, I, they just want to stay and play, and they're taking that money. Uh, example A is Braden Point, and then now we have example B in uh, Sergachev. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, you could even throw Victor Hedman up there, right? Like seven point eight million dollars for yeah for the one best, of the best defenseman, yeah, one of the best defensemen in the NHL. Like it's the same with Steven Stamkos. If Steven Stamkos was healthy, that eight point five million dollars would be like over. Like I mean, Stamkos's value when he's healthy is like ten million dollars, and that's the same with Kucherov. Kucherov getting a nine point five million dollar deal. That's a pretty damn good deal. Um, now Tampa Bay, they still have a lot to like clean up. Tyler Johnson, of course, Alex Kilroyne. So the, we still have a lot of off season to go probably with how the NHL talks have been going on. And, um, between Bettman and fear, not really talking. I seen that tweet uh, a couple days ago about the, uh, the salary, uh, deferrals, which has been kind of the, the big topic for the NHL right now. So hopefully that all goes good and we don't have the big scare, like what ha- MLB had. Uh, when they started up their season there. Yeah. Yeah, you have everything able to fall into place and they can kind of iron out everything and figure it out and then eventually dot all the I's and cross the T's so we can have our uh, season uh, starting and underway. But um, <clears throat> when you look at some moves from this off season, uh, I'll start the same way I did in the last video. We'll start with the underrated. What do you think is a good underrated move, a team either made for re-signing someone or bringing someone new into their organization that they were able to get done? Um, I, I, I was a really big fan of the Colorado Avalanche deal where they went out and got Devin Taves. Devin Taves is a really solid defenseman analytically, uh, which is the reason why Colorado probably even picked him up was because of his analytics. For two seconds for Devin Taves, this is an absolute steal. Then you get him on a $4.1 million contract for the next four years, which is really nice. It's a team-friendly deal. Devin Taves is great for the New York Islanders this past season, uh, point production-wise, defensive-wise. So that will be really exciting to see what the Colorado will be able to do there because now their defense core is stacked all up the left hand, right? you got Ian Cole. you got Ryan Graves. You got, uh, uh, of course, Devin Taves. You got Kale Maker. This team is looking like a really good team. And, oh, and Samuel Gerrard, too. Can't forget about him. Um, I think that was definitely one of the more underrated moves um, throughout uh, free agency for me. And as an Oilers fan, I'm automatically going to go towards Dominic Cahoon, of course, with that nine seven five thousand dollar deal, which was an absolute steal. And uh, last but not least, Tyler Toffoli signing a four year deal with Montreal there for four two point uh, four point two five million dollars. Uh, I think Tyler Toffoli, he's a great goal scorer, and it adds some extra depth extremely amount of depth for the Montreal Canadiens. So I, I, I definitely, that one is another great underrated move this off season as well. Yeah. Uh, Tufoli is also someone I was happy he took. Uh, he's somebody that people were always seem to be worried about wanting too much, like extra, but kind of like mm-hmm. an Anthony Duclair situation where mm-hmm. I was happy he took his market value and got a good deal. Um, where I think would do good in Montreal. They seem to be building up a team that, is churning quickly to building up their new core for the Montreal Canadiens and putting out a pretty good product um, out there. They probably just need to maybe fine tune their defense a little bit more and then mm-hmm. they'll be there. But other than that, they're definitely putting out a much better um, product. But I would say definitely that Taze, uh, we talked about that. Uh, great minds think alike. I fully agree with you on that. That was a great move for Colorado because that just gives you an embarrassment of riches. You oh, have it does. one of the best defenses in hockey. And we have to remember, Connor Timmons is almost ready, if not now, ready to play in the I mean, NHL. That, Byron that's so deep. Yeah. <laughs> that That is such a deep defense core. And they only gave up two seconds. Yeah. Two seconds, right? Like, it, it's barely anything for the signing rights of Devin Taves. It was an absolute steal of a deal for Colorado. And I absolutely love the deal. Um, also, the Nate Smith uh, um, Vancouver uh, deal. That was an absolutely amazing one, too. I think Nate Schmidt uh, will be a great Vancouver Canucks, even though I think the Canucks definitely lost big time this offseason. Uh, Nate Schmidt, I think, will be a nice defender to go alongside of Quinn Hughes. Um, I thought that was another underrated move as well. 
Yeah, and he's another guy that would probably go in the tier of underrated defensemen as well. Nate Schmidt, mm-hmm. a guy yeah. that was able to really get going with the Knights and then uh, make a name for his career. So, yeah, it's good for him to go to a team that definitely needs defensive help. So he'll yeah. be a good uh, player that gets a lot of minutes there. I think a move I really liked, uh, the sometimes when a defenseman or a forward emerges for your team, you tend to kind of give them that one-year deal to see if it's truly where they're... You don't tend to give the full confidence into the player right away, where mm-hmm. that's why I liked what uh, the Blue Jackets did with uh, Gavrinkov, where he came up, played very well, mm-hmm. uh, solidified himself as a good defensive for them, and they already put confidence in three years, 8.4. And if you look at that, that's another deal that if he keeps developing and you keep progressing him at the rate, is going to be a bargain by the time the deal's over, too. So I just really like teams that are able to build up their culture and build up their good continuity within their organization because Mm -hmm. they tend to bank on you at the right time rather than being overly conservative and kind of saying, well, this has been really your first big breakout. Let's wait when you know the guy definitely has the talent and it's the only thing that's going to hold him back is if something like psyche-wise probably holds him back that then you can deal with down the line. So I do really like that move because I'm just a big person for putting the faith in your guys when Mm -hmm. credit is due rather than being overly conservative. I never like those overly conservative, always give their guys one year and say, okay, we'll pay you in the future. It's like, no, (laughs) if you think they're that good, just pay him now unless if there's a more defined reason to pay him in the future like you have to pay more guys and you're yeah. trying to get the break point situation or something along uh, those lines um, I think another move that has a chance of um, being really good will be I mentioned it um when the Devils, of course, also got on top of Kulikov, they got Ryan Murray, who is a guy that I would think at the age he's at, uh, top, more than Kulikov, they would like to see what he can do and then potentially keep in the crop of their defenders to have going forward, where that's why I would kind of put that as an underrated, because Murray mm-hmm. never developed into what they wanted to fully in Columbus, but he at least became, like my friend who's a good Blue Jackets fan said, a good, steady defenseman that people, when healthy, enjoyed watching. He just needs to stay healthy, and then he can be a good at least four defenseman probably. And mm-hmm. then if he can stay healthy, maybe a three and maybe up higher in your lineup. So I think that's another um, underrated move uh, just because – He's a guy that still has untapped skill because he's been banged up. If he can stay healthy, he might be able to be a three or a two rather than just a four. So, yeah, I really like that Ryan Murray de- deal. Like, I think Ryan Murray is a great defenseman. Like you said, when he's healthy, he really is. And the 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 New Jersey Devils need help defensively. They do. They they had a really bad year last year when they expected to kind of improve, and they really didn't. Uh, Jack Hughes had a a pretty bad season, and uh, I think the, even the, especially the Corey Crawford move. I like what the New Jersey Devils are doing for the future of the team. Um, now they need definitely do need to go out there, and, and they have cap space to go out there and do it. They have seventeen million dollars in cap yeah. space, and I don't think the New York, New Jersey Devils are done. I think they're maybe even waiting. Like getting Janssen on what they got him to was pretty cheap. Andres Janssen is a, a great goal scorer, still young. He's 26, heading into his prime now. I think Janssen will be a great player for the New Jersey Devils and will develop into a really nice top six goal scorer. And you get Ryan Murray for cheap too. But the New Jersey Devils are doing is a great way to build up a team's future. This is a proper way to sort of rebuild your team is getting young pieces that are cheap, like Janssen and Murray, that you only have to give away a third and a fourth. Right, it's perfect deals, and and it's this is the perfect time to capitalize on teams' salary cap right now, as everyone wants to make like release some money. We're in a COVID era where there's a lot of money um, that wasn't thrown out there during a free agency. We've been seeing a lot of these dumping of salary cap deals, like the Nate Schmidt deal, like the Ryan Murray one, like the Marcus Newtavaro one, which was also another steal for Florida there. Um, we've been seeing a lot of these deals. So for teams like New Jersey who have money 
like Colorado, who picked up side as well. We haven't even gone to that, that one. That one was a here. steal. Like, you trade Nikita Zadrov, who looked really bad. He was just did not fit into the system of the Colorado Avalanche. And you get Brandon Saad now, who is a really good goal scorer and can put up some pretty good goals. Not that great of a two-way game, like with Chicago there, but I think he could put up some pretty good goals. And it gives them some depth now, too. So... I think that's another underrated deal. There was and like winning so many. Pedigree too. You got cups in the room with mm-hmm. Brandon Saad also. Yep. You always like having that. Oh, yeah. That's for sure. And I think Brandon Saad will bring a lot to that team, especially for $5 million for this one year. It's a perfect like rental deal practically. You're getting him for a year. You get him for that playoff experience. He'll help you out. I think Brandon Saad will be huge. I didn't really see him too much. Actually, yeah, he did great in the playoffs too. I, I totally forgot about yeah. that. Five points in nine games. Um, Brennan said's a playoff performer. We, we've seen it before. He scores a lot of goals when uh, it comes down to the pressure time. So I think uh, siding Colorado, it, it's a perfect fit for the Colorado Avalanche. Absolutely perfect. Yeah, I think that's a trade that might end up working out for... It'll work out better team-wise for Colorado, I think, also because they're in a better situation for the player to pan out. Um, mm-hmm. But I think if there's a team that's going to make Zadorov rebound his career it could be the blue the not the blue jack excuse me the blackhawks have been pretty good with defensemen where they got the most out of a guy like slater Koku, also a slower defenseman that's a big body mm-hmm. defenseman that mostly is defensive and can hit and block shots and he's has a lesser skill set than Zadorov, who was supposed to be a lot higher of a projected skill than he is right and, now and never and maybe up. uh and maybe they're thinking of putting him alongside of Adam Bockwist. You're putting Zadrov, who's a pure shutdown defensive defenseman, maybe alongside of Adam Bockwist. Yeah. Right? It, you help. And Nikita Zadrov has been through the pipeline. Like he's been a lot of places. He's been through some rebuilding teams. So I think he'll help Adam Bockwist. Yeah, he was in Buffalo. So he's definitely known the <laughs> rebuilding feel. So uh, I think him going and playing with either Adam Bockwist or just going to the Chicago Blackhawks point will help a lot with their rebuild that they're going to be going into right now. Now, maybe if I was the GM for the Chicago Blackhawks, maybe I would have went after some picks for Brandon Sad to start building the future up for the team instead of trying to get Zadrov. Cause I think they could have gotten a lot more value out of that deal for sure. For Chicago, like they were the big time losers out of this deal because of the fact that they didn't, pick up too much from that deal. They could have gone a hell of a lot more, but they only got Anton Lindholm and Nikita Zadrov. So, but, and they even retained $1 million of Brandon Sad's contract. So maybe get a second or third out of the deal as well. But that's, that's, that's why you don't do deals with Joe Sackick. He will, he will fleece you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Normally he's going to make sure to get the best end of the stick on those deals. Um, but we talked about our underrated uh, signees. Um, so we'll move into now, if we have anybody um, to pick on. Uh, what team were maybe in a negative sense you surprised they got somebody and maybe in a sense of, I don't know if that guy's going to work out in that type of situation or for that particular team? You know, I, I, I want to talk about uh, Taylor Hall. I, I thought that was funny. But I'm going to go to the Calgary Flames, um, the team that I practically am. I have a ton of buddies who are Calgary fans, and they think that Tanev and Jacob Markstrom are the Lord and Saviors. Um, I am not a big fan of what Cal- Calgary has really done with this offseason. You get Christopher Tanev, who analytically doesn't look great. Calgary fans are saying, yeah, we're going to be playing that bruising hockey. That's not hockey anymore. We don't play that type of style of hockey. You watch hockey nowadays, it's all speed. What was Tampa Bay Lightning? They were a mix of physicality and speed. Calgary is pure yeah. physical and Johnny Goudreau, right? And Magic well, Pawnee. Tampa also learned from that because that's also why they didn't have – they added the physicality through the last offseason, which is mm-hmm. why they lost to Columbus because Columbus had more brute physicality to – sweep them two playoffs ago and then they learn from that and added guys to to man that like the Coleman's of the world and um all Goudreau. those guys there who drove etc amazing sir knock having a bigger role he's a bigger guy that can hit people block shots so etc all that fell into place for them so yeah and in signing Tanev to a four-year deal when he's already 30 years old 
You already got Giordano, who's 37. Why do you want more aging defensemen on your team when you have Volomacki, when you have Anderson, when you have Hannafin, when you got a lot of these young defensemen that could jump into that spot? I don't like how Calgary is rushing and keep pushing themselves like they're acting like a playoff team when they're really not. They're not. They don't have a first-line centerman. They barely. Johnny Goudreau is barely a first-line winger at some moments of time throughout his um, when he's playing. Matthew Kachuk carried them against Dallas, and then you get Jacob Markstrom, who Edmonton Oilers were about to sign, and I would have been. I mean, I would have been happy, but at the exact same time, angry because we would have gave him a five-year, $7 million deal. It would have been horrible. I would have not liked it. But I don't know how well the Calgary Flames are going to do, but I don't think Tanev, it'll be a perfect fit because they're going to be playing that physicality role. But I don't think it's going to work in the NHL because if you're going up against a team like the Oilers or the Vancouver Canucks, what are they going to do? They're going to blast right by you. Right, like yeah. we we've seen it before with McDavid. He's blown right by all the Calgary Flames defenders because they are too slow. I don't know if they wanted to uh, go towards that old style of hockey. I don't know if it's really going to work for the Flames. They're going to make it to the playoffs because of how weak the Pacific Division is, but I don't know how well it's going to work for them. Yeah, I mean the big thing with the Flames also is Goudreau. I think. When he's playing at his best and his head's on straight, he still plays like a top six, oh, yeah. top line guy. It's just he doesn't want to be there. So when you don't want to be somewhere, you're not going to have your best. It's just the way that the the natural human would is. If you're not he, somewhere, you he don't want to be. He doesn't have anyone there for him. Like you have Sean Monahan, who I mean, I give him Sean Monahan respect. He's a good player, but he's. Definitely not top tier caliber where Johnny Goudreau is. They had one good year, and then this year they just really did not play very well. Johnny Goudreau, like I was talking with my buddy, I'm like, Johnny Goudreau is a guy who you need like a top line centerman alongside of him. And of course, when Johnny Goudreau has a clear headspace, he's going to play a lot better when there's a guy that sets him up and sets him up for some good goals. Now, I could even possibly see the Calgary Flames doing really good if you maybe put Elias Lindholm as the center for Johnny Goudreau. Elias Lindholm, playmaker, possibly could do very well with the the Calgary Flames. Um, Also, another team that I think had kind of a rougher offseason was either the Nashville Predators and who... Vancouver Canucks. They didn't have very good offseasons either. The Vancouver Canucks, they did Oh, Arizona. I... I got to talk about Arizona because they didn't do nothing. They lost Taylor Hall and they picked up Tyler Pitlick and uh, Johan Larson. How is that? How is that good? (laughs) Johan Larson, I give the man respect. Great, great analytics and looks like he could be a decent third line guy, but he's a third line guy. And then Tyler Pitlick, I mean, he's, he's a third, fourth line guy at best. Yeah, You've seen him in Philadelphia, right? Like, it, it's a really, it's a gong show team. You have Phil Kessel who doesn't want to be there. You have tons of guys who hate playing there in Arizona. You had Oliver Ekman Larson, who was um, the rumored was he was going to be traded, but then that never happened. Arizona is a dumpster fire right now. They had, without the doubt, the worst off season you could possibly have as a team. Yeah. Yeah, I would say so, because they're also in a situation where if they don't get better economically, who knows how long they'd be the Arizona Coyotes for. Um, So they need to uh, figure a lot of things out for more reasons than just current hockey matter, but also uh, for the betterment of their team in the future. Um, I think uh, for me, a surprising move for me was... I it's not necessarily that they signed a veteran goalie. It's that when Demko came in and really dominated, I had a feeling that that meant mm. that when Markstrom, like the Canucks were going to have a guy that's more like a Corey Crawford type guy that's older and you don't need a Henrik Lundqvist type guy, like a dude that's older that Demko, you know, is going to play more of the bulk of the time when they signed Braden Holpe it wasn't necessarily I don't think he's gonna work it's just why no, <laughs> it, no it was who, more, it was no who more would have been perfect why. in Vancouver 
Mike Smith. Mike Smith and Thatcher Demko would have been the best tandem ever. <laughs> <laughs> That would have been the that would have been the best tandem ever. But I I do agree with you on the Hall B part. Like that was, it was confusing. Why sign up to a two year deal when you got to worry about the expansion draft coming up now too? Like that was weird. Like and you unless if they're automatically go to expose, yeah. Unless if he agreed to expose himself still, because you wouldn't want to expose Demko. That's why that's all confused. That's why I don't understand what that whole. I uh, thought it was weird too. Thing yeah, confusing. yeah, and again, it's not because I don't think Braden Holpe can play good in Vancouver. It's because why? <laughs> like, just get a veteran guy that can be more of a backup. Let Demko really step in and do his thing. That's what I always foresaw them doing, especially when you have a guy come in and is the saving grace uh, to why you even got a couple extra games in your postseason there. So, Especially against the Vegas Golden Knights. Like... That the way that the Vancouver Canucks were playing was very, very good. Like, especially Thatcher Demko against the Vegas Golden Knights. They couldn't score anything. Thatcher Demko got in the heads of every Vegas Golden Knights player, which even happened when they went to Dallas. They still had that thought of Thatcher Demko when they were going up against Kodubin as well. So, uh, I. I, I think that, like, yeah, I agree with you on going for a veteran piece. I think that would have been a smarter idea going after, like, a Henrik Lundqvist or you had Corey Crawford there for a bit. Um, but it was it, – the goalies flew right off the market, like, day one. And I think the Canucks had no time to think. I think they were just like, let's go after Halpy, bring him in for two years. He could be a solid starting goalie for us. We don't have to overpay him like we had to with Jacob Markstrom. And we maybe dump him off in the next year by trade, right? Like it, it could possibly happen, or he just plays second twiddle to Thatcher Demko. Um, but we know what Jim Benning does. He likes to give contracts to random players every year. It seems like last year was like Michael Freerland, and the the years before it was Beagle and Roussel, and it, they have a lot of uh, bad contracts. And if I was definitely in the helm of the Vancouver Canucks, I don't think I would be, I, I, I think I would definitely not sign a goalie and maybe go after some either forward depth, sign just a nice cheap backup goalie, maybe improve on the defense a little bit instead of trying to get and put all your focus into getting a goalie, which a lot of teams were really focused on this year. Yeah. Yeah, I completely um, agree with that. Another one's obviously uh, the Canadians when they traded for and then gave Josh Anderson uh, the seven years, 38 and a oh, half. Oh, God, uh, just, seven so years. So that's a, that's a guy that when he's healthy is basically mm -hmm. a version like a Tom Wilson-esque player. You know he's going to be great in the playoff, uh, can hit, fight, and also score, but – he hasn't been healthy the past couple of years, so that seven-year tag was definitely surprising. And then my last one, even though I really like this guy as a goalie, and he's one of my favorite people in the league when you watch him on interviews, he seems like a great dude. I was surprised mainly with this one because of how early it was in the offseason that the Wild immediately went to Cam Talbot as their starting goaltender for th the three-year deal. That wouldn't be surprising necessarily for the years and value. It's more that was done so early in the offseason. That's why that surprised people, and I kind of agree with that. But I, Yeah, we, Perlo, and John were actually talking about the Cam Talbot deal and uh, how he, well he actually played in Calgary. And it, 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 it was definitely really early on for the Wild, and I thought maybe the Wild was going to go after somebody else. But yeah, like with, a top dude, like one of the. But top I, I think I think the biggest problem with the Wild is they're not a hot commodity place to go to, and we were talking about that in the video there. Like, it's really not a hot commodity to go to. Like Cam Talbot is a pretty good goalie if he is in the right space, right? Like, you gotta play him the right amount of games. He can't play seventy like what he did in Edmonton. That just that kills him. He he cannot get mentally adjusted. He can't get into his right mental space when he plays too much games. This is a type of goalie that plays 40, 50 games, maybe not even fifty, maybe even less than that, um, to really get into that mental space. Which I like the tandem, T uh, Talbot and Stalock. The problem is they're both thirty three years old. Is that enough time for their 
their young developing goalie in uh, Capo or uh, Kalkinen, um, it does that give him enough time to develop and to be that goalie for them or Hunter Jones or whoever will step up for the Minnesota Wild for their future goaltending? That's even if they do step up. But I think Cam Talbot, it was a surprise move to see from the Minnesota Wild getting Cam Talbot. Um, but I do, I like the move. I really do like the move for Cam Talbot. Yeah, I like the move. It was more the reason I put it in a surprise move is with, at that time there was so, all the other goalies available and they went to Cam Talbot on the day that they started doing all the free agency coverage and everybody was like, wow, but he was one of the first goalies off the market. Like That's more why that was a mm-hmm. surprising thing. He had a great year uh, after he left Philly. Always been a guy that uh, I've liked and he's always been a guy. He helped mentor Carter Hart, uh, the Flyers goalie, to uh, help him uh, when he was coming up. Uh, and, I, that's, and that's great experience for Carter Hart because Callum Talbot went through the crab shoot with the Oilers like he really did he he faced everything he played 73 games one year so carrying that experience over for Philly and especially going to the Minnesota Wild and carrying that experience over to there too and having one of the best defensive cores in the NHL for the Wild that will help Cam Talbot out a lot going into next year but yeah it was definitely a surprising move for sure yeah well, um, we pretty much covered all of our off-season stuff here, as uh, the great Pirlo Wisdom will say. That is our full 42, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Uh, for Peyton, as Peyton on the radio, do you have any channel? Uh, that's where you can follow him on YouTube. Do you have any Twitter handle you want to give out for the followers? Uh, yes, I do. It's uh, Peyton on the radio on Twitter, I'm pretty sure. I always forget my Twitter handle. Uh, I do have an Instagram, Peyton on the radio. I don't post on there very much. Uh, but my Twitter handle is Peyton Radio. Um, if you guys want to check me out there and I do YouTube videos as well, Peyton on the radio, I do tons of content, usually NHL stuff, but, uh, thank you for having me on the show. It was absolutely amazing, uh, being on here and making a video with you for the first time. Uh, we've made uh, videos with Perlo before, but, uh, me and you talking a lot about hockey. It was awesome. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate you coming on, man. I really appreciate it. And you're welcome. I would definitely have you on again soon and maybe we can do something uh, for your channel soon, but uh, you can check me out as you know, at JJ Boric 26 B O R E K for the last name spelling on Twitter. And this has been the sports Fanatic news off season hockey check-in show for Joe Boric for Payton. Have a great and safe, pleasant day. And for those American fans have a great and happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Peace out.